we lost our brother Pat Rogers on May 3rd of this year. Pat was home with his wife, Ellen. Uh, he passed away quietly. For those of us who have known Pat for many, many years, um, the spirit was strong, but the body became weak. He was doing what he loved up to the week before he passed away. And he could not have passed from this world into the next in a happier, more prepared manner than what he did. We buried Pat the following week and had his memorial service at the Museum of the United States Marine Corps Chapel, uh, which is sacred ground to all Marines and all Americans. And there truly could not have been a more appropriate place in which we had his memorial. Um, the family asked us to memorialize him and asked four of us to speak about different parts of his life. His lifelong friend, John Matera, who he served with on the NYPD, got to speak about Pat's life as a police officer in the NYPD. Our brother, Justin Dial, Lieutenant Colonel of the United States Marine Corps, retired, spoke about, about Pat's life as a Marine and his great, great, great contributions to our country in the Marine Corps. I, of course, was asked to speak about the part of Pat's life in EAG and how he contributed to the country as a whole of helping to bring good guys home safe and helping them to win the fight. And our brother Paul Buffoni got to speak about Pat's very, very important contributions to our industry, the defense and training and tactical industry. And it was, it was certainly the hardest burden and the greatest honor of my life to get to talk about my, my brother Pat, and we all felt the same way. A lot of you are here today who didn't get to train with Pat, and we're sure glad you're here. And I understand the regret of having waited too long to go and meet such a fantastic human being. And he truly was, out of all the people I've known in my life, the most amazing person that I've ever had contact with. And I, and I say that with no embellishment whatsoever. A lot of people who are here who knew Pat longer than I did and knew him at different periods of his life. But when John and I talked about this, we talked about it being worthwhile since we're here celebrating and memorializing Pat's life, about, about just saying some brief things about the, the scope and breadth and, and profundity of the life that Pat lived. Because some of you may not really be familiar with the story. And I don't know that I'm the best person to tell it. But the story of his life is something that has inspired me for many, many years. Because any chapter about his life to any other average person would be an encyclopedia that they would brag about the rest of their life. So Pat was born in the post-war years in what most of us think is the greatest, freest generation and the greatest period of time in American history. And he was the son of a veteran of the 10th Mountain Division who served in World War II. And as you'd expect, Pat grew up in an environment, in a household, in a family where he was surrounded by warriors, by law enforcement officers, by firefighters, by soldiers, by cops. And it's very telling the effect that that had the rest of his life. And when he was 17, of course, he joined the United States Marine Corps, 1963. By 1964, he was deployed to the Republic of Vietnam as a rifleman and as a tanker. And any of you who got to hear many, many stories about his life, and more importantly, got to see the many, many historical photographs that he kept with him about that period of his life. It was certainly a great, a great, great pleasure, wasn't it? Quite a unique opportunity. Uh, when Pat got out of the service, he did what all young men should. He took a year for himself. He had a very interesting job working for an airline as a courier. And he traveled the world with the airlines and... Uh, that year alone would have been an adventurous movie uh, that, that would have uh, made anybody entertained for hours on end had that movie been made. But Pat's goal when he went back to New York was he wanted to be a cop. Now at that period of time, the way to get onto NYPD is you had to come to that route through corrections. 
So we started out in a corrections career field and wanted to move into NYPD. Well, some of you have heard this story, and I won't tell a lot of secondhand stories about Pat's life, but it's certainly one of the most amusing and best stories he ever told, and I can't do it justice. How tall did you have to be to be an NYPD officer? Taller than Pat. You had to be five foot five. How tall was Pat? Five foot four and a half. So when he went down for the physical and they said, strip your skivvies, get on the scale, and let's measure you. And the guy who measured him said, fuck you, midget, go be a transit cop. <laughs> well, that just drove him over the edge. There was no way he was not going to make that height requirement. So he used to tell us about how he, how he bought books about how to get taller and how he would hang upside down. He'd have his friends stretch him. When he was going back the next time for the physical, he had his friends carry him on a door so he didn't have to walk to the physical side so there wouldn't be a chance that gravity would shrink him back down that half inch. <laughs> All right, it's the midget again. Get on the scale. Five foot four and a half. Get the fuck out of here. So there were several iterations of this, several iterations of this. Finally, his last ounce of determination, he showed up and he was always hoping that there would be a different examiner there who might measure him differently, but it was always the same civil servant there who that was his job, who administered the test every single time. So when he walked in, he said, I want you to measure me again. He said, fuck you, midget, get out of here. You're not going to be any taller this time. He says, just do it. He says, all right, strip down to your skivvies and get on the scale. So when Pat got on the scale, he stood like this. He says, no, no, get down on your heels. And he says, hey, buddy, do me a favor. Get down and look at my heels. He says, what do you want me to do that for? Fuck you. Just do it. Get down and look at my heels. Pat had taped a hundred dollar bill to each of his heels. <laughs> And the examiner stood up and said, it's a miracle! <laughs> That's how Pat made it into the NYPD Academy. If you've never heard that story before, I promise you I could not do it the justice that Pat did. But after he would tell that story, he, even up to the last week, I heard him tell it to somebody. He said, don't tell it, buddy. <laughs> Pat had a very, very successful career with NYPD. When he left patrol, he ended up in anti-crime. Uh, if you've ever seen the TV show NYPD Blue, that was his precinct. He actually thought that was a pretty good TV show, and he was proud of pointing that out to people. And if you need some kind of mental image picture that gives you the idea about what that must have been like the decade prior in the 70s, put that in your mind. After a successful hostage rescue job where Pat was the primary, and I won't go through the details, he was promoted and was sent to TARU, the Technical Assistance Response Unit, which was a technical surveillance unit. By the time he retired as a sergeant, he was the supervisor and lead hostage negotiator from TARU. Now, during this period of time, and it's very hard, if I were a historian trying to make a chronology of Pat's life almost impossible to do because he did so many things so well simultaneously. During this entire period of time, Pat stayed in the USMC reserves and many, many times his particular skills and talents were needed by the country and he was brought back onto active duty. During that period of time later in his career, he applied for warrant officer rank was granted the position of a warrant officer, and that's how he finished his career. Also during this period of time, he was continuing to develop his skills and interest in gunfighting and how to bring good guys home from the fight and to get them to win. All of us have Pat Rogers to look to as the person who is probably the most influential in our lives. I wish I had asked more questions of Pat over the years about how he got to be the person he was with the knowledge he had, but over a decade or so of my association with Pat, while he had a lot of teachers, there truly never was one outstanding figure who showed him the way in the manner that he showed all of us the way, and I find that very, very interesting. And it's something that is really underrated about the genius of Pat Rogers and what he achieved and what he accomplished. 
During this period of time as well, Pat became an adjunct instructor at Gunsight and eventually became a range master at Gunsight. So again, these things are not happening sequentially. Most of these, these things are happening concurrently or simultaneously. Some of the highlights of his life during this period of time. Um, leading up to Gulf, Gulf War I, excuse me, during Desert Shield, Pat gets a call from Colonel Bob Young. Uh, Colonel Young is one who stood up the fast companies and was a very forward-thinking leader in the United States Marine Corps, and, and he had also been a gunsight instructor. And that was a place during those days in the 70s and the 80s where some really, really critical leaders in this country came together and started the basis of a lot of what we do today. But I digress. Pat gets the call from Colonel Bob Young and says, Pat, I need you. He says, Colonel Young, I'm there. So he goes to the West Coast and he starts active duty. He's a warrant officer at this point. Now, for those of you not from a military background, warrant officers are a very special breed. They sit somewhere between the hierarchy of senior enlisted and commissioned officers. And while they are in the chain of command, they really sit outside of the chain of command because most warrant officers' jobs are in a technical position and they're retained as subject matter experts for their technical knowledge. Pat was being brought out to the West Coast Marines to teach marksmanship. What did Pat say about marksmanship? <laughs> he said, when I'm made emperor of the world, marksmanship will be deleted from the dictionary. It's about gunfighting, gun right? It's about gun fucking fighting, right? That's what Pat said. He was coming out to make sure that the Marines who were going over to Desert Shield and then Desert Storm had the gunfighting skills that he needed. So he reported to Colonel Young, and he said, Pat, you're in charge of the gunfighting program. Get out there on the range and take charge. We've got a guy out there, we got a major who comes from the marksmanship training unit. He's not SOTG, he's nothing like that. He's been running the show, you're in charge. Pat goes out to the range and there's a major standing on the range teaching the best kind of Charles Askins marksmanship that you could imagine. Non-firing hand in his pocket, standing 90 degrees to the target, one hand shooting a pistol at 25 yards. Pat walks up to him and says, hi major, you're fucking fired. <laughs> you can't talk to me, blah blah blah. Well, in the world of being a warrant officer, that other person's rank does not matter. You are God. And Pat went to work teaching the Marine Corps gunfighting and getting those Marines ready to go to war. Pat had many, many other high points in his career. One of the very incredible things that Pat did after he retired from the Marines as a civilian was he is hired by the Marines when Force Recon stood up their first truly special operations capable tier one level unit, which was known as DET-1, Pat was brought in as a civilian advisor and was a plank holder of DET-1. Today, as a result of DET-1 and Pat Rogers' work, we then got MARSOC and the Marine Raiders. That is something that Pat had a tremendous, tremendous input in and very few people know it, but he was very proud of it nonetheless. Somewhere during this period of time also, Pat had another career that, that almost nobody, nobody here is actually aware of. And it was only even briefly talked about in fairly obscure ways when his obituary was written. As a result of his expertise, his life as an investigator, other work that he did in the Marine Corps with the Foreign Material Acquisition and Exploitation Unit is he was an independent contractor for an other government agency. We don't have to say what three letters those are, do we? Everybody's tracking with me. This is a part of Pat's life that he was most proud of, and of course, being the professional he was, never, ever, ever, ever talked about, because that's what we do in this community. Or that's how we're supposed to be. He worked with the uh, Counterterrorism Center 
and one of the highlights of that part of his career is he was the subject matter expert evaluator for the Department of State Counterterrorism Assistance Program. Pat had what he described to me as the best job in the world, and he had many of those. His job as the subject matter expert is he traveled globally evaluating different countries' Tier 1 CT units as the evaluator and as, of course, as the intelligence collector about their capabilities that he brought back home to us. So when you've heard somebody say, you know, Pat Rogers was a cop and he was just a regular Marine. He wasn't even in Force Recon or anything. What the hell did Pat Rogers know about gunfighting or about counterterrorism or about room clearing? It just doesn't make sense. OGA and the United States government designated Pat Rogers as their subject matter expert evaluator of what CT operations were occurring on planet Earth. Anybody else who had that on their resume would have listed it at the top of their resume in big black print. And you've never probably heard about it until right now. During this period of time, Pat also essentially invented the industry of tactical training. The short version of this is Pat was such a popular gunsight instructor that over time and during the transition of gunsight from Colonel Cooper's legacy and leadership to the next level of leadership, Pat became so popular that agencies, federal, DOD, and individual wanted to come to gunsight but they wanted to train with Pat Rogers and Pat Rogers alone. Probably caused a little friction in there. And the short story is it led Pat to developing a program where he went out as an individual and rather having the world come to one place to train there, Pat went to the world to do what he did. Because at this stage in his life, his mission became helping good guys win the fight. This was his passion. This was the purpose of his being above all else. When Pat Rogers said, and most of you have heard him say this, God, I fucking hate people. <laughs> the truth is, nobody loved more profoundly and deeply than Pat did. And his entire life was dedicated to helping good guys make it home to their families. He founded EAG somewhere around 1989. What does EAG stand for? No, what does letter stand for? Nothing, right? Does everybody know that, right? We still get that question to this day. But it's worth going over. It's a, it's a fine secondhand story. He called his lawyer and said, I want to form a company. You know, and this is what I want to do. He said, okay, you need an LLC. I'll register your name. What do you want to call it? I don't fucking know. Uh, e something. Okay, E what? I don't know. Let's just make it initials. E A. You got E A something? Okay, we got E A. You want a third initial? Yeah, I want a third initial. Yeah, good. You need it. Well, let's try. E A A. Take it. E A B. Take it. E A. You see where this is going, right? E A G. Okay, that's not registered. Boom. E A G. It is. I have an LLC. I'm in business. That's what E A G stands for, and that's how he came to it. It's not a secret anymore, right? I came onto the scene fairly late, and I came onto the scene with Pat like so many of you. I trained with Pat. I didn't know who Pat was. I know that seems odd sitting here, but I had no idea who Pat Rogers was. A friend of a friend introduced us, and he knew my background from Special Forces and invited me to come out and train with them. And at the back of my mind was, what am I going to learn from a Marine who used to be a cop about gunfighting? You don't know what you don't know. At the end of my first three-day class with Pat, I said, how the fuck have I survived this long? Yeah. <laughs> 
why didn't somebody square me away on this 15 years ago? And why isn't everybody doing what Pat does? At the end of that three-day class, Pat said, hey, brother, give me your number. We had figured out during that period of time that especially through the 80s when I was operational, that we had been in the same country, the same place, on the same operations, and never just been in the same room together. We followed each other all over the world. We knew all the same people. And for whatever reason, I guess I didn't strike him as too big of an asshole. At the end of that third day class, he asked me for his number. And I said, yeah, OK, sure. You know, sounds great. You know, we'll talk sometime. Well, he gave me a call the next day while he was driving home. <laughs> Just like he has to many, many, many of you. There's nothing special about my story. Fortunately for me, however, it was special and that it, it developed into a very strong relationship personally and professionally. And over the next six or seven years, he allowed me to become his AI and his primary instructor for a variety of what we did and had the trust and confidence in me to be able to develop the programs of instruction and the course catalog that we offer today. John Chapman, concurrently at that period of time, also came on the scene. John had recently left his long career in law enforcement and had just come back as a security contractor in Iraq and had started his own training company on the West Coast. LMS Defense. Like all good trainers who seek to continue to improve himself, Chappie ended up training with Pat in the same way that I did. And they formed the same kind of bond. And Chappie became Pat's student, and Pat became Chappie's student. You know, he talked, I don't know if I ever told you this, but when he was building up to go take no light from you, he talked about it for a year. <laughs> he talked about it for a year, how excited he was that he was going to take no light from you. What happened as a result of those formative years in, in the EAG we have today is that Pat Chappie and I decided that we were moving forward together. That Chappie and I were moving forward to add more procedures and capabilities classes into the EAG catalog. And that while Pat, of course, would remain our leader, Pat's love was primarily weapons operator courses. If I've ever seen a human being in my life who had more joy than standing on the square range teaching somebody to be a competent weapons operator, I, I can't imagine who that is on the earth. And we're, we're surrounded here right now by some of the finest instructors that have ever lived. It was Pat's joy. We recorded a commercial, a video announcement, not that long ago, that was talking about the way forward with EAG for the three of us. And we always knew the day would inevitably come where, where Pat would pass on and we would be left to carry on. We just never expected that it would be so soon. So. We're here today memorializing and remembering the most remarkable man that most of us have ever known in our lives. And many of us consider him to be the strongest male figure in our lives, even beyond our own fathers. And the legacy that he has passed on to all of us is simply unimaginable and can't be described. We are moving forward. We are Pat's legacy. This place was inspired and guided and produced largely as a result of Pat Rogers. And we stand today in this most magnificent of places, and I am surrounded by the most magnificent Americans, and I'm simply overwhelmed. The gathering we have today would have pleased Pat in a way that he would not have been able to show or express. The gratitude that we owe to Pat for what he has passed on to all of us, we are doing our best to repay by continuing the mission. 
things are in a state of flux right now. Um, the mechanics of it are this, is that uh, Pat just passed away in May. His estate is being settled. And there are things more important that are happening right now with his wife that doesn't need to be polluted with the crassness of legal documents and ob obligations and agreements. But we're in the process, and it is happening, and it is developing. EAG absolutely will continue. Stand by with us. Have patience. The mission continues. Pat's mission and vision continues through us and through all of you. And that is why we are here, is because of you, Pat's legacy. Thank you very much.